Philippians, we have one more to go after tonight, which will be in two weeks. And then we have our children going to sing to us one Wednesday night in December. And so, I know you've been waiting for the study on Revelations. That will start the first Wednesday in January, just to let you know. That gives me the whole month of December to finish reading three more commentaries that I need to get to on the book of Revelation, since it's such a, you know, easy to understand book. I'm just kidding. <laughs> say that very facetious. Tonight's message is going to come from Philippians 4. The main verses will be verses 10 through 13, and then we'll finish the rest of chapter 4 in two weeks. The series I entitled True Joy, because the number of times the word joy, rejoice, rejoicing is used in the book of Philippians. It's the main theme, how to have joy no matter what your circumstances are. Tonight's message I entitled A Satisfying Life. And I named it that way because of what the text talks about and because of a song that I can't get out of my head, I Can't Get No Satisfaction. And I try, and I started to have Johnny Kinlock sing it for you because since he sings so well. That's the song for most people is they're not satisfied with life. We're going to focus on how we have joy and satisfaction and fulfillment in life tonight. We're going to talk about the word contentment tonight, what it means to be content. That's what it means to be joyful always, is to have contentment. And if I remember right, I preached out of Philippians several years ago, like I'm doing tonight, and I don't know if I named the series this, or I think it was this sermon title. I can't remember which one, but one of the sermons was content or discontent, which tent do you live in, was the title of that one. I remember that because... We all live in one of those tents, discontentment or contentment. And so a lot of people think contentment is being apathetic or lazy or complacent, and so they just don't let anything bother them. But that's not what the scriptures talk about as far as contentment is concerned. <clears throat> Paul says in Philippians 4, verse 10, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. It means they had no way of physically showing that to him because he's writing this on house arrest. He's basically in prison, chained, remember, to a praetorian guard. <clears throat> I thought my throat was better. We'll find out. Verse 11, now that I am speaking of being in need, not that I'm speaking of being in need, but I love this phrase, for I have learned. Being content is something you learn in this journey of the sanctification process. For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. You don't want to be content. The human nature is to complain, gripe, grumble about everything that you don't get the way you want it. But Paul says, I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. That's saying a lot from somebody that's on house arrest, who's chained to a guard 24 hours a day. Then he says, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. It means I know what it's like to be in good times and bad times. In any and every circumstances, here's that phrase again, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Then the famous verse, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You know, the sad thing about Philippians 4.13 is we see it used by athletes more than anybody else. Well, I don't think that was really the intent of Paul saying, hey, I'm fixing to play a basketball game. I can do anything God, that God wants me to. I can have his strength so I can make 50 points and win the game. You know, No, Christ is in us, and no matter what situation we face in life, we can be content because we learn how to be content from God and from his holy word. So I hope tonight... We are learning a little bit more about how to have real contentment or real satisfaction. So here's some ways from our text to have real contentment or satisfaction in our life. Because when we are content, we are satisfied with life. And that song, I Can't Get No Satisfaction, is because of the way people look at the worldly view of being satisfied. The more they get, the more they want mentality. Here's some things we can learn tonight if we're going to learn to be content. Number one, learn to avoid comparisons. 
You will never be satisfied. I will never be satisfied in life if we compare ourselves with other people. We'll always complain about our salary because we'll be always comparing ourselves with somebody else's salary. We'll be comparing somebody's house to our house, somebody's car to our car, somebody's children the way they behave to our children the way they behave. We'll always find every time we compare, it'll lead to one or two sins. It'll lead to pride. We'll think we're better than somebody. Or it'll lead to desiring materialistic things that never bring real satisfaction in life. Again, we have to learn this. Philippians 4.11, I put on your handout. Not that I am speaking of being in need. For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Paul says, I'm not in need. I have nothing that I need. He's in prison. Probably wasn't eating real well. I have nothing that I need. Paul says, why? Because I realize everything I need comes from God. And I'm content wherever God's placed me that he is there to supply all my needs, Scripture says, in Christ Jesus. I put some other verses that really the Holy Spirit impressed on me as I was studying for tonight. 2 Corinthians 4, 16. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction, remember this is Paul again, the power of the Holy Spirit. What he sees happen to him that most people would, oh, poor, pitiful me, this has happened to me. Paul sees it as a light, momentary, temporary affliction. It's preparing for us an internal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Paul says this affliction is small in comparison to what's going to happen to me in glory one day and how God's going to use the situation in my life right now. <clears throat> Verse 18 as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, not materialistic things the world looks at. For the things that are seen are, and I love the ESV translation here, transient. We live in a transient city. There's a lot of people that come in this city and quickly leave the city. A lot of people that come to church here and three weeks later they'll move. A lot of military people here that'll stay here for a couple years. This is considered a transient city. When you see the word transient, it means temporary. For the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. What brings us real satisfaction in life is not things that can be here today and gone tomorrow. What brings us real satisfaction in life is those things that are eternal. So don't compare yourself to other people because we usually compare ourselves to other people dealing with materialistic things. We're always wanting what somebody else has. We don't realize that we really don't want what they have because we don't know the debt they have that they haven't paid off to get the things that aren't really theirs but the bank anyway. I put this in my notes. It's not on your handout, but three misconceptions about happiness. This might be something to jot down. This really helps me. Three misconceptions about happiness. I must, number one, I must have what others have to be happy. We think that's going to bring happiness. If I can finally get that, then that will bring me happiness. And then once we get it, we realize that's not where happiness comes from or joy comes from, so we're seeking something else. That's the myth behind all fads and fashions. That's what entertainment world does. They create something that they want everybody to want so they can sell their product, and they want every kid to want it, and they don't think they're happy till they get it. Right shoes, right pants, right shirt, right logo on it. I can remember when, when I was in high school, this really dated me way back, 1985, 86, when I was a freshman or sophomore in high school, that you know, wearing polos and izods was the thing in high school. And you weren't it in, considered in school unless you had a polo or izod on. And I couldn't afford a polo. My parents couldn't afford a polo. So my mom found some alligator iron-on patches and so we got the basic shirt, and she ironed those on. Pretty embarrassing when you're sitting in class and your alligator falls off. <laughs> when you look back, it's, you know, why does it matter what's on your shirt? Whether it's a fox or an alligator or a polo guy on a horse playing, what does it matter? 
Is that really what's important in life? But I'm telling you, there's still some young people today that think that's what's important in life. Because they're learning to compare themselves and they think they won't be happy unless they have the right clothes to wear. You know, it's amazing when your twin brother has two older boys than you do. Noah never wore a new outfit <laughs> until he got to be about four and a half or five years old. Because we had all these hand-me-downs that were, I mean, kids don't wear clothes long before they outgrow them. And they had all these clothes and people were like, oh, that's a really nice shirt. And it might be a polo. Like, yeah, I didn't, I didn't buy it. You know. But um, those things really don't matter. We ought to be thankful we're in this Thanksgiving season. We ought to be thankful we have clothes to wear. Shoes on our feet. As uh, about half the world doesn't. And so um, we're very blessed. But we spend our time comparing ourselves. And that makes us very unhappy. So one misconception about happiness, I must have what others have to be happy. Number two, I must be liked by everyone in order to be happy. I must be liked by everyone in order to be happy. Now let me just, just don't bust your bubble. You don't have to be liked by everybody to be happy. I didn't get an amen on that. You do anything in life around enough people, somebody's going to disapprove. Somebody's not going to be happy. You know, you realize that Jesus couldn't please everybody? Now, we'd be foolish to think we can do something Jesus couldn't do. Because Jesus wasn't approved by everybody. But sometimes we do things that we shouldn't do because we are concerned with the approval of people. And we think if everybody approves of us, that that's somehow going to make us happier, more satisfied more content in life. Third myth about happiness, having more will make me happy. Howard Hughes was asked, how much money does it take to make a man happy? He said, just a little more. More money more usually relates to more expenses because the whole saying, the more you get, the more you want, that's the human nature mentality. Having more will not make us more content because our contentment doesn't come from things. Our contentment and satisfaction in life comes from God through the power of the Holy Spirit. I put 1 Timothy 6 next, if you look at that with me on your handout, verses 6 through 10. But godliness with contentment, there's that key word tonight, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Being content and satisfied with what God's given you goes a long way and bringing joy in your life. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. I say it all the time, you'll never see a U-Haul behind a hearse. But if we had food and clothing with these, we will be content. The basic things in life. God promises to meet our physical needs. We, he made a lot of promises in the world. He never promises we'd be rich materialistically. He did promise he would take care of us and supply our needs, not our wants or desires. Flip over your page. Verses 9 through 10 are on the back of 1 Timothy 6. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, a trap, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. You know anybody that's been ruined or destroyed based on greed? Lose their family over it, lose their job over it, always wanting more of what the world has to offer? Verse 10, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It doesn't say money is the root of all kinds of evil. God's made some people to be wealthy. I got some friends of mine that God's blessed financially, and I think he blessed them. I, I know he blessed them because they give so much back to help other people. But the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving, this desire, that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. They brought on much turmoil to their life, much tribulation to their life, on their own fault. Having more will not make you happy. Having more will not make me happy. And I've learned having less sometimes makes me happier. 
less to deal with. Some pastors think getting to a bigger and bigger church is, you know, it's like climbing the corporate ladder of success in business. And some pastors think the bigger the church they have, the more content they will be. I can tell you it's much easier pastoring a small church than it is a large church. Number one, learn to avoid comparisons if we're going to be content, satisfied in life. Number two, hang with me tonight. Don't get mad at me yet. Learn to adjust to change. <laughs> the words you don't want to hear in a Southern Baptist church. Change. Life is full of ups and downs. Emotionally, physically, mentally, financially. There's nothing certain in life except change. We're in a changing world. It's amazing to me people that get upset in the church when things change. You know, they don't get upset when they're driving a nicer vehicle that's got GPS and all they used to not have or a cell phone instead of that big honking phone you used to have in your car. If you all remember those, my mom had one of those bag phones. Try taking that with you in your pocket into the grocery store. You know, they have no problem with change in, in technology because it's advantaged them, but please don't change anything in the church because that's the one thing they see as stable. And sometimes we let change, whether it's at our job or our church and our family, we let those changes rob us of joy, keep us from being satisfied. I mean, how well do you handle change? How well do you handle when things are shaken up a little bit from what you know? Do you get frightened, moody, angry, uptight? Paul says the secret of contentment is avoiding comparisons and also dealing with change. Paul had to go through many changes, from starting churches to being chained to a praetorian guard. Philippians 4.12, Paul says, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty, being hungry, having abundance, and being in need. He's learned, no matter what his circumstances changes to, to be content in who he is in Jesus Christ. Let the stock market change. Let somebody's football team that's doing good change in their performance. I won't mention the Saints tonight, but let's let anything around people change. I mean, their whole satisfaction life has to do with that not changing. And they let it dictate their whole life. The Berkeley translation of Philippians 4.12 says, I have learned to be independent of circumstances. I have learned to not let my circumstances dictate my satisfaction. Think about Paul writing this. He's older now, all alone, except for the guard next to him that he's probably sharing the gospel with often. Cold Roman prison. He's away from his friends. But he's continually saying, look, no matter what my circumstances change to, he says, I've learned to be content. And I, he says, I have no need. He's not sitting in a very wealthy place with all the physical resources he needs around him when he's saying that. You ever heard somebody say this phrase? I'm okay under the circumstances. You know, one place you don't want to be is under your circumstances. They were never meant for us to be under them. We need to get on top of our circumstances and learn that we have a choice to make on whether we're content with what God's given us or not. I found this in a commentary. I think it's pretty neat and it will help us tonight. There are three kinds of circumstances in life. Number one, those I can control and I do. Like if I'm watching TV and I don't like the show, it's not bringing me satisfaction. <laughs> I can control it and I can change it. If I'm hungry and I have resources to buy food, I, I can go buy food. I can do something about what I'm not content about. That's the first choice we have, first kind of circumstance, those I can control and do. Number two, those I can control and I don't. Now, hear my heart on this. If there's things you can control and you don't, it's usually due to complacency or laziness 
And so don't get upset in your life if there's things you can handle, but you just don't choose to handle it. Here's the one that we're talking about tonight, number three, the third kind of circumstances, those I cannot control, and those are many in life. That's where you need contentment in the uncontrollable circumstances. Now, I hear people often complain about circumstances that they have control over to change. I meet people almost on a daily basis that come to the church that need food or money. And some of those, not all of them, but some of those refuse to work when they could. They don't like their situation and they think their situation is very unsatisfying in life, but they refuse to do anything about their situation. But they could if they wanted to. New law that was passed, I'm trying to remember what state, Illinois or somewhere that was passed, that you can't get food stamps unless you're a in training for a job or you can prove you're attempting to get a job. Probably not a bad idea. There's people that can't work, there's people that have needs, but there's also people who refuse to try to help their situation. We're not talking about those tonight. We're talking about uncontrollable circumstances that rob us of satisfaction in life. Sometimes we have to learn to adjust to change Often that's to the people around us. Because people change. Nobody that's married tonight gave me an amen on that. <laughs> the person you marry 10 years later is not the same person you marry. Because they're changing. Hopefully it's for the better, not the worse. I love Romans 12, 18. I put it on your handout. Because we let change with relationships and all kind of things affect us. If possible, that's a key phrase now, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. You can't control how other people act. You can only control how you act. And I would say one thing God's teaching me to do a better job of is to act and not react, because there's a big difference. But we can't control what other people do, but as far as it's possible to us, we need to seek peace, satisfaction with the relationships, but we can't control how the other person acts. You know, God's taught me sometimes in those situations, having a sense of humor goes a long way. Learning how to laugh instead of complain. Learning how to laugh at things that come in life. Because sometimes things are just funny in life when they come. To see your son rolling on the floor because you don't take him to McDonald's for breakfast to get his McMuffin that he wants because he got in trouble at school two days in a row and you promised him you wouldn't take him to McDonald's if he got in trouble at school. And Daddy, I gotta have that McMuffin. I'm like, you just gotta laugh. You're not, is a McMuffin that important in life? That you're gonna pitch a fit over it? We got cereal. So. <laughs> Number three tonight. This is getting increasingly important. Number three tonight. Learn to draw on Christ's power. He gives us his strength, he gives us his power. We need to rely on his strength for satisfaction in life. Or we'll look at the things of this world. We'll be comparing what others have to what we have. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things, not some things, all things through him who strengthens me or through him who gives me strength. All things. Jerusalem Bible says there's nothing I cannot master with the help of the one who gives me strength. I, I love this. I should have put this on your handout. The Amplified Version. Amplified Version takes many different versions and puts them together. The Amplified Version says, I am ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses inner strength into me. That is, I'm self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. I love that Amplified Bible on that. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. If we really believe he's sufficient, that he holds all the power in the universe and more in his hands, then we trust him to infuse us, the Amplified Bible says, plants his strength in us for us to allow his strength to flow through us in every situation. If we do that, 
we'll be satisfied because we have Christ's strength and power flowing through us. The Greek word for strength here is dynamo. It's where we get the word dynamite from. Explosive power. You know, Paul had a problem. We don't know what that problem was. We just know it was a thorn in his flesh that he asked God to remove a few times, three times. Some people think it was his spouse, but we don't know if he was married or not. That was a joke. We don't know if he's married or not, but that, that, was, that part wasn't a joke. But Paul said this right after the thorn in his flesh. But God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power, dynamite, is made perfect in your weakness. My grace is sufficient for you. That word sufficient is the same word we get contentment from. My grace is going to give you contentment. My power is in you. So number one tonight, we're going to be content in life, find our strength from God, learn to avoid comparisons, learn to adjust to change, learn to draw on Christ's power. And number four tonight, learn to trust God to meet my needs. If I trust God to meet my needs, then I'm content because I know he's God and he can handle anything. I have nothing to fear. I have nothing to worry if I'm trusting God to meet my needs. If I'm trusting myself to meet my needs, I'm going to be anxious. I'm going to worry because I know what my limitations are, and there are many. But when I trust Christ to meet my needs, then Philippians 4.19, and we'll get to more in two weeks, but listen to Philippians 4.19. And my God, I love that phrase, and my God, he's your God, right? And my God will supply every need of yours, how? According to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. God has all the riches, all the things that really matter in life. And it says, if he's our God, we trust in him, he will supply every one of our needs. We live in a name and claim it prosperity gospel country. And if you want more things materialistically, you just seek after God and he'll give them to you. Nowhere is that really recorded that I know of in the scripture. In fact, I don't see it proven in a lot of people's lives like the 12 disciples. I wouldn't look at their lives, what happened to them after Jesus rose from the grave and consider them very prosperous as the world says lives. They were basically wonders, nomads. And they died, most of them, horrific deaths. Except for John on the Isle of Patmos. And his life wasn't pleasant on that Rock Island. My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. You know, there's an estimated 6,000 promises in God's word. We don't really claim our trust in a lot of those promises the way we should. If we really believe that God will provide our needs according to his riches, then we will ta we'll take him at his word, won't we? I just put one in my notes, Matthew 6, 31, Sermon on the Mount. So do not worry. Where will my food come from or my drink or my clothes? Your heavenly Father knows you need all these things. Instead, be concerned about everything else with God's kingdom. That's the good news translation. And he will provide you with all these other things. If we focus on God and his kingdom, we seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. All these things is not talking about what the world says is important. All these things is what God says is important, like love, joy, fruits of the Spirit, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, Scripture says, there is no law. So I guess the question tonight is, for me and for you, are you really content in life? Now, before Chrissy's mother had all the health problems, if you asked me, I'd say, yeah, I'm content. But then our world was shaken up, had a little change, you know. Everybody loves having their mother-in-law move in with them, right? Everybody likes change. I shouldn't have said that the day before my 10-year anniversary. But um, still learning. When change comes, you know, I found myself sitting around complaining a lot. My contentment in life is not dependent on circumstances. Because if that's where I base my contentment, the enemy's going to make sure my circumstances change for the worse, often. 
My contentment, my satisfaction is in Christ and His sufficiency. And if I believe that, then that joy of Christ's power in me will be flooding through my life. It's the same for you. You compare yourself often with what others have. Do you resist change? No matter what the change is, just resist change for the sake of resisting change. You know, that's why the comment's always out there. Well, we've never done it that way before. Not a logical reason on why we shouldn't change it. <laughs> just, we've never done it that way before. Just to resist change for the sake of resisting change. Or do we let everything that comes our way, do we evaluate in light of what's important in life? Those things that are eternal, not those things that are transient or temporary. And do we find real satisfaction in Christ? You know, I don't think Christians should be singing the song, I can't get no satisfaction. Because we're fully content, or should be, in Christ. It's amazing to go to a believer's funeral where the person was just sold out for God and it was evident to all around and you walk into a service for somebody like that and I've been to many of them since I've been here as your pastor there's sadness but there's rejoicing and there's just this atmosphere of being content even in death you know why? because only Christ's sufficiency can bring that because I go to a lost person's funeral it's totally different there's nothing, there's no contentment in the room. Just anguish and remorse and grief. People looking for satisfaction, but they can't find it. Because when it all comes down to at the end is our own contentment comes only from Christ. And if we have that contentment, we'll be satisfied. No matter what our paycheck is, no matter what kind of car we drive, no matter what kind of house we live in, we will be content and we'll stop wanting more and more and more of what the world has to offer and only what Christ and his sufficiency has to offer for us. Let's pray. God, thank